So to give you a little introduction, I grew up in northern Kentucky. Um, and I grew up near a site called Big Bone Lick State Park. Um, and this area um, was an area where a lot of uh, large megafauna bones like mammoths and mastodons were found um, in, I believe, the 1700s was when they were first described. Um, and this site was actually incredibly important because it influenced um, Western ideas about both evolution and extinction. Um, before um, these bones were found, um, people basically thought um, the earth was a constant and was sort of perfect and things never really changed nor went extinct. Um, and so um, many people were very interested in the site, including um, President Thomas Jefferson, who sent William Clark um, out to this site to collect bones to bring back to the White House. So it's, it's, it's a very important site, which a lot of people are probably not very familiar with but had kind of an influence in my sort of upbringing and thinking about time um, and extinctions and the past in a different way. And then Northern Kentucky is also an area where it's very easy to find, there's a lot of shale, so it's very easy to find fossils and bones from different eras. Um, you can find both um, fossils that used to be underwater. These are crinoid fossils, which look sort of like plants, but are actually an animal species that used to live underneath the water. And there's still actually crinoids that live today. They're in the you know starfish and urchin family. Um, and you can also sometimes find bison fossils um, and other um, extinct, and those aren't extinct, but um, locally extinct species um, from earlier, from more recent eras. So I wanted to talk about two um, main projects um, that I've been working on for quite a while. Um, the first project is um, rewilding. So rewilding is an actual environmental practice where people are restoring ecosystems and also re uh, restoring um, specific species back into environments. Um, and those in Montana probably are very familiar with the restoration of wolves. To Yellowstone Park, um, which is probably one of the more famous uh, rewilding projects that's gone on in this country. But rewilding can also involve uh, creating wildlife corridors and areas for, particularly for animals to um, move through, um, both migrate and also to find food, um, which becomes much more important as climate change occurs. And this was one reason I was particularly interested in this dam site, because I think about it as a rewilding site. It's um, allowing um, the water to be restored and also um, the fish to again have passage. Um, the, the, the removal of the dam also changes the, the temperature of the water um, and allows sort of nutrients to cycle in a different way. So I was really excited about this residency and about coming here. And many of these uh, rewilding projects involve what are called keystone species or species that even in small numbers sort of have this big dramatic effect on the ecosystem. And without those species, the ecosystem changes also very dramatically. Um, I had the fortune of doing a residency uh, in the Yonoko National Wildlife Refuge um, in 2016. Um, in 2015, a population of wood bison had been released into this refuge from um, Canada. It was the first time in a hundred years that wood bison had lived in the United States. And so as part of this residency, I was tracking the bison and sort of learning about their effects on the ecosystem. Um, and for an example of bison affects the ecosystem in so many ways, but to just give you a brief example, um, bison have this behavior where they roll around in the, in the, the, the ground and create what is called wallows of compacted dirt. Um, this compacted dirt later often creates temporary um, wetlands that are beneficial for birds and also amphibians. Um, their hair, which they shed in the spring um, after the winter, is used frequently for uh, bird nests and studies show that when birds use that hair in their nests, they have a higher percentage of young that survive because it's so warm um, and also um, safer for the birds. So, there's many ways that bison affect the ecosystem, but this is just two examples as a keystone species. So in my performances, I um, treat them both sculpturally and um, performatively. I make these large scale masks out of fabric um, and other materials. And the reason I treat um, 
them in those ways is because the actual environment or the actual rewilding processes that go on scientifically are also incredibly sculptural and performative. Um, above you see um, an example of a woman wearing um, a costume of um, an adult whooping crane and she's teaching these young whooping cranes that are being um, that are on their way to being released um, how to search for food and also how to sense danger. So this is incredibly both sculptural and performative. And then below you in Montana may be more um, familiar with the California Condor Project where people are using these um, uh, rubber hand puppets to feed condors so that they do not imprint on um, their handlers. Um, as I work in wildlife rehabilitation, so this is also something I'm very familiar with, but it's really amazing for me to see these sculptural, um, uh, I guess, evidence of different rewilding projects that are going on around the country. Um, and there's also um, definitely a cultural and spiritual um, aspect to the rewilding of many of these species. This is an image from Shagaluk, which is um, the site of where the bison were um, rewilded. It's an indigenous village in uh, Western Alaska that borders the Inoko National Wildlife Refuge. And the people there were extremely excited about the bison being returned. Um, many species, including the bison, were purposely purposefully eradicated um, as sort of a, a racist um, a racist action to force the um, indigenous people off of their lands and um, onto reservations, um, remove that important food source and also force them into more of a capitalist um, system. So my masks are quite large and heavy. Um, they're made out of fabric, as I was saying, which is very durable for taking them out into different locations. I even brought one to Alaska on this residency. Um, and I use, I frequently, when I'm wearing them, they definitely change my um, body posture because they are so heavy and I'm interested in that interaction. And so um, I also cannot usually see when I'm wearing them. So I'm forced to sort of interact with the landscape in a very different way. And I use frequently what is called a, a tableau vivant format, which is uh, translates to living picture. Um, you may not be familiar with the word tableau vivant, but the, uh, the practice of tableau vivant, you're probably um, familiar with what is believed to be the first tableau vivant, which was um, Francis of Assisi um, staged in 1223, a, a Christian nativity scene um, using live people and animals to sort of um, show uh, uh, Jesus' birth and to sort of initiate um, a reverence in that way. And it's still considered, you know, a tableau vivant that we're all probably pretty familiar with. But tableau vivants were also very popular during the Victorian age as sort of a precursor to film um, and uh, video where people would um, dress up in, in different costumes and stage either paintings or historical moments like this uh, staging of um, Joan of Arc. Um, the format also became very popular during the women's suffrage movement where women would um, sort of reenact these things on, on the grounds of the Capitol to um, encourage the, the, the right to vote. So as I was saying, I make these uh, fabric masks. Um, they are hand stitched out of fabric. They're stuffed with uh, polyfill pillow, pillow type stuffing. And then I treat the surfaces with acrylic and other mediums. This one's of a pronghorn. Um, I usually like to show an in-progress one so that everyone can see what they look like as they're developing, um, and I use a lot of reference photos. This particular pronghorn um, was used at a residency in Tucson um, where I was really interested in um, exploring both um, climate change that was affecting the Sonoran pronghorn in the area, but also the use of borders and the militarization um, of that um, that region um, that's sort of restricting the movements of species. Um, so I filmed a video for that piece in all of the current habitats of the Sonoran pronghorn. In 2002, there was a drought um, in Arizona. There's obviously a lot of droughts going on now, um, but the population of Sonoran pronghorn in the United States dwindled to 21 individuals. 
And so a captive breeding program was started and they um, ended up bringing over pronghorn from different populations in Mexico. And currently there are four populations of Sonoran pronghorn um, in the world, uh, two in Mexico and two um, main ones in the United States. The pronghorn also move um, through um, the through Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument and through the Tohono O'odham um, tribal land, which is also split up uh, between um, north of the border and south of the border. Um, so I spent a lot of time both um, speaking to people of the region about the issues of the pronghorn, um, its, its um, restrictions in terms of movement, um, and uh, and uh, uh, camped in all of these locations and filmed a video, um, which is available to see on my website. I also made some other sculptures as part of this, and this is just an example of this. This is a ceramic um, a cactus piece that is split um, in half with a piece of uh, plexiglass. I also make other pieces related to rewilding. Um, this is a large scale um, hand sculpture that uh, with these um, hand built ceramic oyster shells. Um, currently in New York City where I'm based is uh, rewilding or restoring their oyster beds, um, which will help. Oysters are also considered a uh, keystone species, so they will help uh, filter and clean the water. They will help mitigate flooding um, because they um, help stabilize coastlines and they provide food for a number of different species. So they also have this really big effect on the ecosystem. And then another part of my practice um, involves looking at these um, ancient um, offering vessels. These are ancient um, ritons, they're called. They're animal-shaped vessels. Sometimes these ritons were um, like an entire animal, and some of them also were part of an animal, like a head or a hoof. And they typically um, held um, important, uh, expensive liquids for offerings, like olive oil or wine. So I started making in ceramic my own version of these ritons um, for use in videos, sculptures, and performances. And sometimes they stand alone as pieces like this. Um, but in the first iteration of making them, I positioned them at the edge of the shoreline and allowed the tides to gradually fill and drain them as a way to sort of think about uh, climate change and rising tides differently. I've gone on to make um, some right and offering vessels. Um, this piece was made um, for my show in Tucson. Um, this is a hydroponic grow system. Um, hydroponics uses up to 80% less water than traditional farming methods. This is obviously a very small scale, but the water um, cycles through the different right in vessels and then there's edible plants being grown in the, the basin at the bottom. Um, and last summer at Franconia Sculpture Park, which is a park in Minnesota, um, Schaefer, Minnesota, I created this very large scale uh, right in. I was interested in this site um, because it's um, they use traditional burn practices on the prairie um, to sort of restore the, the grasslands and, and spread seeds every um, spring. Um, and they allow all those prairie grasses to grow. Um, most of the areas around the sculptures are mowed and my piece is the only one that is actually embedded within the prairie. Um, and this piece I was considering sort of a pollinator right in vessel. So it's within the, it, uh, it's raised up on these metal beams. It was fired in um, six ceramic parts and then re, um, rejoined after the fact. Um, and it's been exciting to see it sort of change with the seasons as well. So since being at the site, um, you can see how um, this site really is influential for me as a rewilding um, place. But I've also been, um, I created these special uh, Riton offering vessels that I've been using on the site and filming myself um, with um, pouring liquids into the site, which you all get to experience after this. Um, and here's some examples of that. I've mostly been working on a video and then also doing some filming underwater too, um, because I was very interested in um, the water of this site and the idea of it sort of being unleashed and um, returning to its um, former, former pathways. 
So I have a selection of um, ceramic Riton vessels that are just down the hill um, that you will be able to engage with. There are buckets of water and you can dip uh, water into the vessels and then pour them back in into a specific area of the dam site. Um, we definitely ask that you stay within um, sort of designated areas of the dam. Um, there were um, tens of thousands of plants planted um, for this restoration, so we definitely want to make sure that we're respecting the site and that we're not trampling uh, plants or going where we're not supposed to. Um, there are also um, our photo releases that I would love for you to sign if you want to participate in the site just so I can document it and use it um, within the video um, and potentially show it at a gallery space in the future. Um, and if you need help um, sort of carrying the vessels to the site or if you have kids that want to participate, please ask one of us for assistance um, and I hope, hope you will participate. Yeah, thank you.